This is an ODB Films production. Visit odbfilms.com today. In Latin, Renovo means to renew, restore, or revive. This show is all about growing in our understanding and practice of faith. Past episodes are available wherever you like to listen. I'm Doug Took, the director of ministry at ODB Films, and today we look at a small little topic called grace. G-R-A-C-E, God giving you what you don't deserve, right? This topic has no controversy whatsoever and has never crossed division in any Christian church ever in the history of the world. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. We talk about it all the time, and I'm not just talking about prayer before meals. I'm talking about really delving into the reality of the meaning of this space. And so we want to talk in a little bit more of the theological side of this topic today. And I'm excited about it for all of our Renovo listeners. So a couple things. If you if you took your parish catechism classes when you were a kid, uh, you, you probably remember that there's two kinds of grace. There's sanctifying and there's actual. And that might actually be all that you recall. And that's okay. The names are really similar. And, and you might actually think that that they're identical, that they're the same thing. And that's that's actually not really true. And so we want to break that open today in the show. Sanctifying grace is is all about the soul. It stays in the soul. It's what makes the soul holy. So it gives the soul supernatural life. We'll unpack that later, okay? More properly, actually, it is supernatural life. It's God's gift. It's God's love, okay? Now, actual grace, by contrast, is is like a push or an encouragement, a supernatural push, okay? It's transient. It doesn't live in the soul, but it really acts on the soul from the outside, so to speak. All right. So it's a supernatural kick in the pants. All right. It gets the will and the intellect moving so we can seek out and keep sanctifying grace. Does that kind of make sense? So imagine yourself, uh, let me think like transported to the bottom of the ocean. Okay. And what's the, what's the first thing you do? You die. Okay. (laughs) That's it. You die. You die because you aren't equipped to live underwater. You don't have the right breathing apparatus. Okay. Now, if you want to live in the deep blue sea, you need uh, equipment that you aren't provided with naturally. So you need something that will elevate you above your nature, something super that is above natural, such as oxygen tanks, scuba gear. So it's much the same way with your soul in its natural state. It isn't fit for heaven. It doesn't have the right equipment. And if you die with your soul in its natural state, uh, the scriptures teach, the church teaches, heaven's not for you. What, what, What you need to live is supernatural life, not just natural life. Does that, I mean, is that kind of, so I'm, I'm using a lot of words here, but I just want to make it as clear as possible. So that supernatural life is called sanctifying grace. The reason you need sanctifying grace to be able to live in heaven is because you will be in perfect and absolute union with God, the source of all life. Galatians 2.19, 1 Peter 3.18, check it out. So if sanctifying grace dwells in your soul when you die, then you have the equipment you need and you can live in heaven, specifically in union with our Lord. Though you may need to be purified first in purgatory. We've talked about that a ton, right? See 1 Corinthians 3.12-16. through 16. So if it doesn't dwell in your soul when you die, in other words, if your soul is spiritually dead, by being in the state of mortal sin, see Galatians 5.19, okay, you can't live in heaven. You then have to face an eternity of, of what we really basically call spiritual death, the utter separation of your spirit from God, see Ephesians 2. Um, the worst part of this eternal separation will be that you yourself would have, have caused it to be that way. That's where grace really unpacks itself. Think about this. Think about the notion of like spiritual suicide. You're, you're really choosing not to be in union with God's grace. You can obtain supernatural life by yielding to actual graces that you receive. God keeps giving you these divine shoves, these pushes, and all you have to do is really go along. And this is where we start, this is where we fumble, right, sinners? This is where we mess it all up. We don't go along with this deep-seated love that our Lord has for us, the free gift of eternal life that he has for us. So for instance, he moves you to repentance and if you take the hint, you can go find yourself in the confessional. All the guilt of your sins is remitted, right? See the gospel of John chapter 20 through the sacrament of penance, through your reconciliation to God, you receive 
sanctifying grace, but you can lose it again by sinning again, which we do. See 1 John 5, right? So keep that word in mind. This notion of mortality, mortal. Mortal means death. Mortal sins are deadly sins because they kill off this supernatural life. Does that, does that kind of make sense? The sanctifying grace gets killed off when we just turn our backs to it, when we ignore it. So mortal sins can't coexist with the supernatural life because by their nature, these sins are saying no to God, no. So while sanctifying grace would be saying yes. Now, venial sins, they don't destroy supernatural life and they don't even lessen it. Mortal sins destroy it outright. The trouble with venial sins is that they really weaken us. They make us more vulnerable to mortal sin. So when you lose supernatural life, there's nothing you can do on your own to regain it. You can't. You're reduced uh, really to that, that notion of natural life again. And no natural act can really merit any kind of supernatural reward. You can merit a supernatural reward only by being made able to act above your nature, right? Which you can do only if you have help. Grace. That's grace. We want to regain this supernatural life. You have to receive actual graces from God. So think of these as helping graces. These graces really kind of differ from just sanctifying grace and that they aren't a, a quality of the soul and they don't really abide in it. Rather, like actual graces enable the soul to perform some supernatural acts, such as an act of faith or repentance. If the soul responds, to actual grace and makes the appropriate supernatural act, it again receives supernatural life. Now, don't let these words confuse you. Supernatural act is the act, the leap of faith, right? The gift. Soren Kierkegaard unpacks that term for us. It means to believe and to repent. Thank you, John the Baptist, to empty your cup and let it be filled by him. That is important. So that's why reconciliation is such a big deal when it comes to being in relationship and being in harmony with God, our creator. It means to be really cleansed, right? Sanctifying grace implies a real transformation of the soul. So think about like um, a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters uh, in the, in the reformation, they really, they really, they kind of denied that a real transformation takes place. They, there was a lot of emphasis on God doesn't actually wipe away our sins. Our souls don't become spotless and holy in themselves. Instead, They remain corrupted, sinful, and full of sin. God merely throws a cloak over them and treats them as if they were spotless, knowing all the while that they are not. But but that's not that's not really the Catholic view. We we specifically believe that our souls really really are cleansed by by this infusion of supernatural life. Paul talks about this. St. Paul speaks of us as a new creation. See 2 Corinthians 5:17. He says, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Look at Ephesians 4, 24. So, of course, we're still subject to temptation to sin. Duh, we're human, right? We still suffer the effects of Adam's fall in that sense, what theologians call concupiscence. Okay, but God removes the guilt from our souls. Did you hear that, Catholics? God removes the guilt from our souls. We may still have a tendency to sin. But God has removed the sins we have, much like a mother might wash the dirt off a child who has the tendency to get dirty again. And let's be honest, parents, what child doesn't have a tendency to get dirty again? We always cleanse our children. Our souls don't become something other than souls when God cleanses them and and pours his grace into them, what what the scriptures refer to as infused poured grace, right? Look at Acts 10, 45, Romans 5, 5, Titus 3, 5 through 7. They don't cease to be what they were before. But think of it this way. When grace elevates nature, our intellects are given this new power of faith, something that they don't have at the merely natural level. Our wills are given the new powers of hope and charity. Things are, they're absent at this merely natural level. Level. I know this is kind of heady, but it's kind of awesome. It's super encouraging to think that the role that God plays in our life, the the longing for partnership that he seeks from the beginning of time, actually really equips us to be more than what nature provides, to be super nature, to be super 
natural by the nature of the relationship of our soul. You wonder why faith matters. This is why it matters. Okay, let's talk about some words that have caused a lot of controversy. So the the terminology for justification and sanctification, and this is where Catholicism really separates itself. It's very different than what our beautiful non-denominational brothers and sisters within the Christian church have been convicted by over, over time. So we've mentioned that we need this notion of sanctifying grace in our souls if we're to be equipped for heaven, right? Clearly made. Okay. Now, another way of saying this is that we need to be justified. Okay. Uh, once again, Paul says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. That's in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. The, the Protestant and, and, and sort of non-denominational understanding here and what, what the church would say is kind of a misunderstanding of justification really lies in the claim that justification is merely like, like something that's just forensic or, or purely declaratory. Like you just say it and it happens. It's like a legal declaration by God that the sinner is now justified, right? You've heard this before. Like if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and savior, he declares you justified, though he doesn't really make you justified or sanctified. Your soul is in the same state as it was before, but you're eligible for heaven. There's some challenges here, okay? A, a person is, is basically expected thereafter to undergo sanctification. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking um, when our non-denominational brothers and sisters say sanctification, that it's unimportant. It's not unimportant, but the degree of sanctification that's achieved, it, it is ultimately kind of immaterial to the question of whether you'll get to heaven or not. You'll, you'll, you'll sense, here's what I mean. Since you're justified and justification is a purely like declaration is all that counts, that's not going to work. Unfortunately, this, this scheme is, is more, it's kind of like legal fiction. It's like a fake narrative of what righteousness really is. It amounts to God telling an untruth by saying that the sinner has been justified while all along he knows that the sinner is not really justified, but is only basically covered under the cloak of Christ's righteousness. Now, what I'm using is I'm using the language of some of Martin Luther and John Calvin's teachings specifically, okay? What God declares, he does, okay? What he declares, he does. Look at Isaiah. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So listen, so when God declares you justified, he makes you justified. Any justification that is not woven together with sanctification is no justification at all. So the scripture's teaching on justification is a lot more um, nuanced. Paul specifically says, he says that there is a real transformation which occurs in justification. It's not just something you say. It's not just a change in legal status. And this is seen in Romans 6, 7, which every standard translation um, our Protestant brothers and sisters, their translations included, render as, quote, for he who has died is freed from sin. That that line exists. Paul is obviously speaking about being freed from sin in an experiential sense. For this is the passage where he is at pains to stress the fact that we have a decisive break with sin. That has to be reflected in our behavior. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? This is Romans 6. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Again, Romans six. Okay. The context here is what our, our, our non-denominational brothers and sisters, our Protestant brothers and sisters really call sanctification, the process of being made holy. Now, sanctification is the sense uh, in which we are said to be, quote, freed from sin in the, in the passage that I just read. Yet in the Greek text, what is actually said is, he who has died has been justified from sin. So the term in Greek, dikaio, is the word for being justified, yet the context indicates sanctification, 
which is why every standard translation renders the word freed rather than justified. And this shows that in Paul's mind, justification involves a real transformation, a real experiential freeing from sin, not just a change of status. I have decided Jesus Christ is my savior. Boom, therefore it's done. No, there, there has to be a true transformation of heart. And it shows that the way he uses the terms. There is not the rigid wall between justification and sanctification that sometimes our Protestant and non-denominational brothers and sisters have declared. So according to scripture, sanctification and justification aren't just one-time events, but are ongoing processes in the life of the believer. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Both can be spoken as past time events, as Paul mentions, and uh, he says it in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. He says it, right? Sanctification is also a present, an ongoing process. As the author of Hebrews says, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's Hebrews 10. And in regard to justification, also being like an ongoing process, look at Romans 4, 3, Genesis 15, 6, with both Hebrews 11, 8, Genesis 12, James 2, 21, Genesis 22. All of these passages, Abraham's justification is advanced on three separate occasions. There's a great uh, um, preacher that I like out of Texas in the village church And um, he talks specifically about progressive sanctification. He's very Baptist. But to be honest with you, that kind of preaching is startling. It's actually kind of difficult to to sell to to really a belief that, no, it is a moment. So he's really taking leaps forward in that, which is kind of cool. Matt Chandler is his name. He's great. Great podcast. Braving Baptist preacher, progressive sanctification. He's alluding to more consistent. What's more consistent here? Than basically Catholic teaching. So the question then has to become, can this be lost? Like, can justification be lost? And we'll get to that after our break. ODB Films is a nonprofit Catholic ministry dedicated to artfully made, spiritually rich films. We invite you to visit odbfilms.com and preview over 200 of our short films designed to complement your ministry needs. Also, Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter for previews of upcoming content and access to sneak peeks of future projects. Visit odbfilms.com today. Now, most fundamentalists go on to say that losing ground in the sanctification battle will never jeopardize your justification. You might sin worse than you did before getting saved, but you'll enter heaven anyway because you can't undo your justification, which has nothing to do with whether you have supernatural life in your soul. Calvin actually taught that the absolute impossibility of losing justification was a part of the mission. Luther said it could be lost only through the sin of unbelief, and that is by undoing the act of faith, rejecting Christ, but not by what Catholics call mortal sins. Catholics see this a little bit differently. If you sin grievously, the supernatural life in your soul disappears, since it can't coexist with serious sin. You then cease to be justified. If you were to die while unjustified, this is hell. This is in scripture. This is, this is real. And I know that so many people hate hearing that. No, you just go along to get along. This relationship is thousands of years old. The idea of just denouncing grace with your mortal sin does have recourse, people. That is real, okay? But you can become re-justified, right, by having the supernatural life renewed in your soul. And you can do that by responding to the actual graces that God sends you. So how do you act on actual graces? He sends you an actual grace in the form of a nagging voice sometimes that whispers in your ear, you need to repent, go to confession. You do. Your sins are forgiven. You're reconciled to God and you have supernatural life again. Yes. It's in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Check it out. Or you say to yourself, maybe tomorrow, and that particular supernatural impulse, that actual grace, it kind of passes you by. But another is always on the way. This is God we're talking about. God is ceaselessly pursuing you. He's never abandoning us to our own stupidity. Read 1 Timothy 2.4. 
for all of us that are stupid, me included, he'll never abandon us to our own stupidity. So once you have supernatural life, once this sanctifying grace is in your whole and your soul, you can increase it by every supernaturally good action you do. Now, be careful here. This is not earning faith. This is not earning love. But we grow in holiness, receiving communion, saying prayers, performing the works of mercy. It's worth it to increase sanctifying grace once you have it. Is it is it the, the minimum? Is it, is it enough? I mean, the, the idea is that this great joy, the, the reception of graces really helps us grow in faith. I mean, I understand having the minimum. I get it. But how much more joyful are we when we grow in that love? Yeah, right. It's, it's, it's enough to get you into heaven, right? But it may not be enough to sustain itself. And it's, it's easy to fall from grace. We all know that, right? The more solidly you're wed to the sanctifying grace, the more likely you can withstand temptations. Those of us that, are, that succumb to temptations regularly, we need this in our lives, okay? If you do that, if we, if we continue to pursue grace, we maintain it. We maintain this sanctifying grace. In other words, once you achieve the supernatural life, You don't want to take it easy. The minimum isn't good enough because it's easy to lose the minimum. We must continually seek God's grace, continually respond to the actual graces God is working within us. Does that make sense? Inclining us to turn to him and to do good. This is what Paul discusses when he instructs us. He says this in Philippians. He says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, But much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Philippians 2, 12 through 16. That's what it's about. God giving us what we don't deserve in grace and our response as the pursuit of holiness, the lifelong pursuit to grow in our love for him. This is grace. Thanks for listening. Sincerely, we're partners in the journey of faith. And I hope you will share the Renovo podcast with your friends and with your enemies. Send your topic suggestions, questions, and or comments to Doug at odbfilms.com. Friends, always remember to engage the tradition and live the conversion. Until next time, God bless.